<laughs> he takes the right. shot. <laughs> right. I mean, John the Baptist, John the Baptist, you know, you know, you should really be baptizing me. I shouldn't be baptizing you. Yeah. You really shouldn't be washing my feet. And I, I just think it's almost, it's almost comical. Here are these situations where people are telling Jesus, you know, you really, you really shouldn't do that. <laughs> or, uh... Okay, we're back again with the second book, uh, Matthew, the Passion, the Gospel of Identity. We've done the, the, the Gospel of um, Passion, and we're entering into the Gospel of Identity. And so as we move through Matthew, I think it's important to note just how many times he makes reference to the prophets and the scriptures that spoke mm -hmm. of Jesus' mm -hmm. birth. And he's writing to tell these people, look, here he is. To me, you know, the funny thing about Matthew, um, Mike, you can share if you agree or not, but to me, the, the weird thing of Matthew is it's it's the, the most Jewish gospel, and yet yeah. he was a tax collector. He was, yeah. you know, supposed to be the rejected of the Jews. So it's yes. to me, it's such a weird contradiction that that actually ends up being the gospel that focuses the most on showing the Jews who their Messiah is. Right. Well, and that may... Maybe that's because he's writing to Jews and he knows the only way he's going to connect with them is to show them that Jesus is the fulfillment of this person that's spoken of in the Torah. Maybe uh, uh, he had a, a, a change of heart and, you know, embraced his Judaism. That's what John Stotts believed. And then uh, some more liberal scholars think that Matthew just collected because uh, Papias says Matthew collected the logia, the sayings of Jesus. Yeah. And and if you flip through your red letter Bible, there are five blocks of red letters in Matthew. That's just how it's set up. And some people believe he, he did the collecting and someone else in his community wrote the rest of it. Mm. I'm, that's a little shaky for me. But, yeah. Um, but definitely, it, isn't it interesting that the worst Jew on Jesus' team wrote the most Jewish of all the Gospels? Yeah, that's you know? the interesting thing. So, so for those listeners who are not exactly sure what we're doing right now, uh, we're going to be talking about each Gospel writer. And right now we're focusing on, well, the second book chronologically, but the first book in the Bible, in the New Testament, mm -hmm. uh, Matthew. And um, we're joined by uh, Michael Card, a wonderful man, just sharing on, on the amazing things that he has um, really got to share with us about this commentary. I really do see it as a commentary. It's something to be read alongside the Bible readings that you have. Um, and I, I love that mm -hmm. how that's like set up with you for, for this books, for these books as well, the four set volume that as you go through, you see chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and, and you read through that. Um, so tell mm -hmm. us a bit, let's go back a bit back and tell us a bit about Matthew and how his life impacted his style of writing, uh, you know, being who he was. Like you mentioned, okay. we don't know a whole lot about Matthew. Uh, but yeah. we don't we don't everything we know about Matthew we know from his gospel and where he he refers to his own coming to faith he we do know that uh, a Jewish tax collector would have been um, reckoned with you know prostitutes and murderers he wouldn't have been allowed to go to the synagogue yeah. um, he would have been very looked down upon so perhaps he was an outcast uh, he was looked upon as a traitor because he was collecting taxes for the Romans it's not Jewish temple tax he's collecting he's collecting roman tax so uh but uh, when it comes time for him to uh i think he jesus shows this marvelous open openness to him which everyone else is upset about right they they don't think jesus should have matthew as a even the other disciples don't want jesus to have matthew uh, as one of one of the 12 so maybe that's what turned him around and made him embrace his judaism again i never thought of that maybe that's the reason but uh, and, and maybe the reason is he comes to know Jesus. And then after knowing Jesus, he realizes that all of these passages in the Hebrew Bible talk about Jesus. And maybe that's what gets him excited about the Hebrew mm. Bible again. I'm not really sure. But yeah. what Matthew does that's unique, every single thing about Jesus in Matthew is substantiated by a passage from the Hebrew Bible. Uh, the best example to me is he, Jesus moves. Or, or Jesus is born in Nazareth. No, he moves to Nazareth. And, and the, the Matthew says, this is to fulfill the prophecy that he would be a Nazarene. Yeah. And I, def, I defy people that show me where that prophecy is. There's no prophecy that says he will be a Nazarene. There's a prophecy that says he will be a branch. And that's the word Netzer. And exactly. Think, well, that's that's, what, that's that, where they that's claim what, it comes yeah. from. Yeah. 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 But Matt, you know, interesting. Matthew, uh, he divides his book into five blocks, just like the Torah. 
and he substantiates everything uh, mm-hmm. with the with the Hebrew Bible. Maybe in some way this uh, was well, also to prove to his, you know, the Jews of the time that somehow he had still tried to connect, remain connected to to that heritage by by yes. kind of putting up the Bible or or his account in in such a way as to be almost Torah yeah. friendly or you know uh, Jewish friendly in, yes. a, in such a sense. Well, I'm not almost very very much very Torah much friendly. so and. And, and if he's writing to, to uh, the other thing, and this is, we get this from reading between the lines, but if he's writing to Christian Jews, which is the, pr- practically the only kind of Jews there were in Matthew's time, most, most uh, Jewish, most Christians were Jews. Uh, these are Jews who are still in the synagogue. They're still going to service. They're still reading, quoting the Amidah. They're still doing all those things except they found the, the Messiah mm. and they're worshiping right next to people who, who deny that he's the Messiah. And so mm. what's happening is they're being expelled from the synagogue. And that's the group that I think Matthew's writing to really targeting, uh, his targeting because he, they, they don't, they don't know. They don't know who they are anymore. You're a Jewish mm. person. You're kicked out of the synagogue. You have no identity. Mm. And so I think that's why Matthew through you know he remembers all these things of jesus telling his disciples who they were yeah what their identity was and i think that that's the really the key to, to matthew so so how does matthew kind of reemphasize to the jewish believers that they are now indeed closer to their god than they could ever be before it, how does he how does he use that fulfillment you know to to emphasize that point the fulfillment of this prophecy the fulfillment of that prophecy this and this does it try and tie in you know, what Jesus' ministry resembled to him with what they're seeing in the Old Testament? Well, if you're a person, if your whole life, and and this is, I think, true as with no other people group as much as it is Jewish people, uh, if your whole life is grounded in scripture and and, in the Hebrew Bible and, um, and, uh, and, and observance and all those things, I mean, Mm -hmm. what you wear, what you eat, everything is dictated by Mm -hmm. your Judaism. Well, uh, so I'm a person, so I, I, I discover that Jesus is this Messiah that my people have been looking for, and I see all these passages in the Hebrew Bible that refer to him and, mm-hmm. and help me to understand who he is, and then um, along, along comes the Gospel of Matthew, that, where Matthew's done my homework for me and, and, yeah. and, and outlined all of those passages for me. Um, I realize I, I'm not disenfranchised anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, even though maybe my parents have kicked me out or put up a tombstone with my name on it and said that I don't, you know, that phrase, you're dead to me, that's from Judaism. Yeah. Um, uh, I realized, no, I, 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 I am connected. I still, in fact, in, in many ways, this is the fulfillment of the faith that it goes all the way back to Abraham. Mm. Yeah. Jesus mm. met Abraham, right? Yeah. He and rest, that's, Jesus and- wrestles with yeah yeah yeah, yeah. With they are yeah Jer- uh, with jacob uh, that as they'd like to call the pre-incarnate christ yeah that is yes it's yeah. it's right throughout but but you know that is such a yeah. powerful statement actually that he makes in 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 doing that in in showing that jesus was kind of there all along like he was foreshadowed right throughout and and it's not something right. new it's not a new uh message that's being preached it's the fulfillment of what was uh from yeah. the beginning and what's been pointed yeah. to from the beginning. And that, that's an, that, that, is, that essence is in all the Gospels. I mean, when John says uh, he was full of, full of grace and truth, that's Exodus 34. That's Hesed Vahemet. John reveals, you know, who Jesus is. He's the word who's full of grace and truth. I mean, yeah. I, I think all, all of the gospels are trying to make that connection, connection. And, and, and demonstrate that this, this promise that was made, I mean, from the yeah. very beginning, I mean, that's what John says from, from the beginning is, is, is become incarnate in this person. Yeah. And, and, and certainly for Matthew and for his community, that would mean a lot. That would be yeah, that's that's a huge thing for for a yeah. community like that to swallow um mm-hmm. but but mm-hmm. i i also love how you know when you when you look at uh the sermon on the mount and how jesus just kind of turns societal norms on its head um i i love how that maybe also perhaps was a way for matthew to be like wow i feel i feel kind of safe in this in this rebels community because it's like right. you know he's going for it and he doesn't really care in that sense like how offended people around him are because he's saying yeah. what what is straight from the father and and matthew i think somehow 
Yeah. He kind of looks up to that. He's like, wow, I, I couldn't perhaps do that. Or I would like to be like that sure. in a sense and, and, and serve someone of that capacity. Yeah. Well, you know, I think there's a unique moment in the gospel of Luke that uh, it's, it says Jesus full of joy through the Holy Spirit. There's nothing remotely like that is ever said of him anywhere else. So you've got to, if, when that's said, you've got to really listen. And what yeah. fills Jesus with joy through the Holy Spirit, Luke says, is that he says, I praise you, Father, you've hidden these things from the wise and you've revealed them for, to little children, yeah. this radical reversal. And if you're Matthew and you were looked upon as, you know, cursed and, and uh, you know, uh, on the same level with murderers and adulterers, and all of a sudden Jesus is telling you you're accepted yeah. and you're in the beloved, that's uh, huge. That's yeah. got to change your life. That's yeah. huge. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. huge. Amazing. So when, you know, to me also, you, Matthew kind of primarily wrote to convince the Jews that Jesus of Nazareth was indeed their promised Messiah. So we, we've dealt mm -hmm. with that. It follows. Mm -hmm. So as a matter of course, that this gospel is, like you said, saturated with the references and such of the Old Testament. It, so, okay. So we've, we've also come to understand that this is to further drive home the point that there is indeed a connection between uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament, and the fact that all things, as as I know Chuck Missler, as some people have mentioned, that um, the prophecy, how does he put it, the prophecy in the Old Testament is is concealed and it's revealed in the New Testament. It's it's the concealing of something mm. uh, within the customs and the traditions of one segment, and then it becoming fulfilled in the person of Christ. And Mm. do you think that's that's an, a mindset or a shift in mentality that's really hard for jews today even to make uh not not even talking about even accepting jesus as messiah but but yeah. in order to actually believe that that fulfillment was complete i i think it's a mystery paul paul says i don't know a veil covers their eyes you know paul can't even even paul can't understand i think uh because it, it once your eyes have been opened and you see all all of the evidences in the Hebrew Bible of who Jesus is and how he perfectly fulfills and the in the crucifixion is one yeah. of the most stark place where every single verse there, there's you know there's this is Psalm 13 or this is Psalm or this is Isaiah 65 or this is whatever mm -hmm. um and and we I spend and you spend a lot a lot more time than me in Israel and you you meet with people and you think how can you not get this? And I, I don't, I don't know if we can explain, you know, but Paul has all kinds of ideas about that. The Gentiles have to be brought to. Uh, yeah. I don't the know. Full, the full first, number. The yeah. Jews, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I, I just think fundamentally it's a mystery. It that, really uh, is. God reaches out to yeah. his people. Yeah. In the, in their terms and fulfilling their images and their scriptures and they don't get it. And, and I mean, even, behold, even the, I think the, the Peter glory. mentions that even the angels long to look into these things and to understand the mysteries yeah. of these things. Yeah. Yeah. And then our, these goys, you know, that's us, right? Yeah. We, we seem to get it. We seem, yeah, we seem to get it. And uh, <laughs> I, I, that's a mystery. I think it it's really a is. A mystery. I can't explain yeah. that away. Yeah, for sure. Because it, sure. it shouldn't be, shouldn't be, <laughs> but it is. Somehow yeah. it is. Yeah. All right, so this is uh, Matthew that we took a look at. Anything else, uh, Mike, that you'd like to add to this, uh, to, to specifically to Matthew's gospel? Well, the, the one moment uh, or the one focus uh, that we can uh, point to uh, is um, Matthew is written at a time when the synagogue service is coming together. Uh, we don't really know in Jesus' day what the synagogue service was like. We really don't even know what the word rabbi means in Jesus' day. There's no such thing as an ordained rabbi in Jesus' day. But we do know that right around 70, when, when Matthew was written, the synagogue service was coming together. And uh, something called the 18 benedictions were formulated. Some of them had already existed, and they were all put together. Uh, the Shimon Israel or the Amidah. Amidah means to stand up because you stand up when you say them. And uh, a, a benediction was added. I won't read the, the other one. They're all blessings. They're all beautiful blessings, actually. They're still read in the synagogue today. But number 12 says, and for slanderers, let there be no hope. And for the Nazarenes and the Menim, let their wickedness perish as in a moment. And there's this curse in the middle of all these um, 
uh, blessings. And um, I believe that, that that's the life situation of the, of the first readers of the Gospel of Matthew. They're in the synagogue reading these benedictions that have just been introduced. And one of them is a curse on them. Wow. And so what do you do? Yeah. Uh, and my mentor used to, my mentor used to say that, you know, as we're reading these uh, benedictions, I'm going to look at you really closely when it comes to number 12 to see if you're going to read it. Cause it was believed that no one would curse themselves. And so <laughs> that's what, you know, that's what the first readers of Matthew are dealing with. They're being kicked out of Jewish, not just a synagogue building, it's Jewish life. Yeah. And uh, they don't know who they are anymore. Yeah, that's a different form of persecution. It's psychologically actually much more intense yes. of not really knowing who you are anymore, identity-wise. Right. But even Bob, today, Bob and I, I want to tread carefully when I mention this, because I think it's a, quite a sensitive topic, but even Messianic Jews today, I think it's a really hard thing for them to know how to 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 shift over these, their two, these two different worlds of Judaism and Christianity, and they don't really know how to reconcile or how to how to make that yeah. that change. And I mean, I've spoken to some friends uh, who also uh, are believing uh, Jews, and uh, even the, the word Messianic Jew, I feel is problematic in some instances. Yeah. Because yeah. it makes, it it's confusing. It, it's like, you know, you have Christians, you have Jews, and then you have Messianic Jews, and where do they fit in? Like, <laughs> it's kind of floating, right. you right. know, and, and I wish, yeah. I wish that there could be a better understanding, especially between Messianic Jews and Christians of, of how do we... How do we make that? How do we bridge that gap? How do we collaborate together within this? The, the intent is that there's no Jew, no, no Greek, no slave, you know, and, and somehow right. there's still this gap between these two people. Yeah. And, and that to me is sad. What is, the, what is the last thing that Jesus asks from the father in the garden of Gethsemane? The last thing he asks, which you would think, well, this, that would be important if it's the last thing he asks. The last thing he asks is that would be one. That's his, he, he pleads with the father that we would be one. Yeah. And I, my, and when, when they go into these kind of discussions, I'll just ask people, is that not enough for you? That's what Jesus asked for. The last thing he asked yeah. for the father, can we, can we just be one? And, and the, the truth is we are one. We are one, but we live in denial of that. Mm. We have one spirit, right? And uh, maybe that's one reason why it's so hard. We, it's not that do you we think have it's the cultural differences fix. that we do not want to surrender uh i think that's part of it i think that's part of it i but and i think it's just an identity issue too yeah yeah i remember someone once said that uh when you come to repentance your culture also has to come to repentance and um uh, i think you know there's some that's interesting good. you know concept in that in the in the sense that you know, we, we have a danger of making it cultural Christianity. And obviously you see this in, in yes. different situations, but you know, then you come to a different culture and you're like, oops, okay. They do things differently in, in their faith in well, in Christian faith, in the same faith that we have, mm -hmm. uh, does that affect you to the extent where you can't be one with them? And if that's the case, why mm -hmm. is that the case? You know? Uh, so really just submitting cultural pride to, to God and saying, Lord, heal us, save us from yeah. that, that problem of, of the church today. Well, I think. Jesus Lordship is absolute. That's one of the really scary things about Jesus. In fact, it's the scariest thing about Jesus to me and his Lordship is absolute. You, if you, if you don't take up your cross, you can't be my disciple. Yeah. And um, one of those things he's Lord over is our culture. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. His lordship extends over that. Yeah. I think Matthew is, is a good book to make that known, you know, that God is the God yeah. of identity um, and, yes. and that you, you do find your identity and your wholeness only in him. We're talking yeah. to Michael Carr today. Once again, thank you so much. Uh, that's the end of Matthew, I believe. And we'll be shifting over to, I think, your second favorite book, or would this be your favorite one, Luke? <laughs> mm -hmm. So we're shifting over to Luke and I'll be talking a little bit about um, his background and how that serves to, to help us in our Bible readings and in our personal lives. Thank you so much for tuning in. Stay tuned for the next one.